that you're holy. And Lord, we acknowledge that your plan and your purpose before the very foundation of the world, God, was to redeem sinful individuals just like myself and those standing within this worship center tonight. And God, for that reason, we come before you tonight with hearts full of gratitude. Lord, hopefully a life that puts our adoration on display by the way that we choose to live and to move in the community where you've placed us. God, as we move into a season that, our Lord, is wrapped in giving, that is wrapped and cloaked with generosity, God, may we understand that that flows from the greatest giver of all time, and that is you who, Lord, when we were still sinners, you sent your son Jesus as a gift, as a ransom for us. And so, God, we come before you tonight with hearts full of gratitude. God, even in a culture and a world that just continues to, to chase after and to, to gather and to receive more and more and more, God, may just for a few moments tonight, may we just sit and ponder the generous heart of the living God tonight. Lord, I pray that as you speak to us, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and that he would convict us, that he would use the word to expose areas of deficiency in each of our lives. And then, God, may we not just be hearers of your word, but, Lord, may immediately, may we begin to exercise, may we begin to walk out, may we begin to, to follow Jesus in the fullness of as obedient children. And we pray this in the most awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to grab those. If you're using Version, the online Bible app, um, your notes are there for you tonight. If you click that button uh, that says live, uh, it'll take you to the notes and... Um, and, and for the most part, we're going to be in Philippians tonight, okay? Um, I'm going to have you kind of bouncing around, so um, all the, the, the specific individual verses are not listed in version, but we're going to generally um, be in the book of Philippians. As I begin to think about this, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there, beginning next weekend, I'm going to start a brand new Christmas series, and the Christmas series is titled The Generosity of God. The generosity of God. I, I don't know if you've ever really looked at Christmas through the lens of this reality, but, but God is a very generous God. Um, the whole reason we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the whole reason we celebrate Christmas is that he saw our plight, he saw our sinful condition, and in his mercy, in his grace, and most certainly in his generosity, he gave to us in his son Jesus the perfect spotless Lamb of God. And so we're going to talk about the generous heart of God throughout the Christmas season. And so tonight I want to kind of just build a bridge, if you would allow me to do that. I want to get us thinking in terms of generosity. But it's interesting because here we sit on Saturday evening, kind of sandwiched between what's known as Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Okay? For some of you, Cyber Monday is not that big a deal, but for this generation, for the tech generation, um, Cyber Monday is quickly, quickly taking more and more of the pie, so to speak, okay? But, but for those of us that we can relate to and we know all about Black Friday, which, by the way, some of you, you saw my post um, this weekend, um, you know, back in 2005, Black Friday started like at 5 a.m., and you know, it just keeps creeping back. By 2020, we're going to start Black Friday like on the 4th of July. Um, here's the reality. We live in a, in a culture, um, and if I were to ask you as individuals, or, or we were to look at maybe um, just different sections, cross-sections within the church, 
We would say we're in a down economy and things are tough and, and churches, the giving is down and the, the reason giving is down in the American church is because the plight of the American family and the unemployment rate and we're all not so sure about Obamacare and all that. I mean, we could just, whatever. But when it comes to going, hey, why are you not being faithful? If I were to ask the cross-section of the church, why are you not being faithful in your giving to the Lord? You would give me a whole bunch of excuses, reasons, and some of them could be valid, some not so much. But we, we tend to be tunnel vision, and we kind of miss the reality of what's happening in our culture. So let me just share some numbers with you and, and, and see if you can figure out what's happening, okay? Check this out. The first number is in 2010. In 2010, on Thanksgiving weekend, kind of between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the American population spent in that weekend over $45 billion. Okay? That was in 2010. Now check this out. In 2011, it climbed a little bit to over $52 billion in the course of one weekend. And then last year, in 2012, check this out. It made a jump again. It was over $59 billion. Let me just ask a question before Cana goes there. What do you think this year's going to do? It's trending. This year, the expected projection is well over $60 billion. Did anybody see what was happening there? What was happening? Come on, it doesn't take rocket science. It's going up, right? Isn't that interesting? We say we don't have it. We say we can't give it. But yet in our culture, that number continues to rise. And I know for some of you, you're like, well, I don't know. Let me just break it down to kind of bring it kind of to us as individuals. In 2010, in 2010, individuals spent approximately $365 over that weekend. The average American spent $365 over the course of that weekend. And I know some of you are going, no, that's not us. And all that. I'm just giving you kind of the average, okay? And then in 2011, the average household, the average individual, they spent $398 in this weekend. You seeing it? Check this out. Last year, it jumped to $423. What do you think the anticipation and projection for this year is? More. Nearly $500 a family over the course of a weekend. So now here is the deal. Here is the reality. Now, I preach and I instruct and I teach as your pastor because, yes, we have a church budget. Yes, we have salaries. Yes, we have utility bills. Yes, we have a mortgage. Yes, we have all those things to pay for. But, but I want you to disconnect from that for a second. Because I'm not talking to you tonight necessarily as your pastor who has this huge need for you to meet and take care of. That's not what I want to do tonight. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your heart as a believer and a follower of Jesus who he calls to be obedient. Say obedience. And so tonight we're not talking about a budget. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about you and your specific heart as it relates to generosity. Okay? And so we're going to talk about generosity tonight. I love it because the reality is, in Scripture, there is a church that we see in Scripture that is generous beyond generous. There is a church in the Scriptures that is generous beyond generous, and we're going to talk about this local church, this local body of believers in just a second, but I want to show you this, this verse. Throw that up there, Cana. Philippians 4.19, it's a verse that we all love, we cling to, and, and let me just say this. This is one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. This is one of the greatest Scriptures for you and I, the greatest promises that we can latch on to, okay? And, and this first time we look at it, I want to give it to you in the message because I just love the way that it reads, okay? Now, here's what it says. You can be sure that God will take care of everything. Say everything. You 
can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. Let's take a second and define everything. All, everything. The word in, in the Greek is pas. It's a little three-letter three word, P-A-S, pas. And it is all-inclusive. I mean, it's everything in all seasons, at all times, everything. Okay? So now this is the promise of God. Listen to this. You can be sure, you can be certain that God will take care of everything you need. His generosity exceeding yours. Okay? His generosity will always exceed yours. Some of you have heard it said this way. You can't outgive God. His generosity, listen to me. Some of you need to listen to this tonight. His generosity exceeds yours. His generosity exceeding yours in the glory that pours out from Jesus. Now we love to claim this promise. And my God shall supply all my needs. We can be sure that, that he will meet and take care of everything I need. Well, many of you go, well, I don't understand why in my life he's not taking care of everything I need. I, I don't get it. I don't see that he's doing that. Well, can I just tell you this? Everybody look this way. little secret. Every one of God's promises come with a premise. Okay? So there's a condition. And many of us, we like to pull this one little verse right out of context and go, whatever I do, whatever I think I need, he's got it. He's kind of like my just big grandpa God, right? He just gives me whatever I want. Well, it has a condition, and we really have to look at it within context, okay? We really have to look at it within context. And so that's kind of where I want to go and what I want us to do tonight. And so if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And I want us to begin in verse 14. Philippians 4, beginning in verse 14. We want to see this in its fullness. We want to see what the condition is for you and I. How is it that we can claim this promise? Look at verse 14. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I met you out from Macedonia, listen to this, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Verse 17. Not that I was looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Now listen to verse 18. Some of you might need to circle this, make this personal. Paul says, I have received full payment, and what? And even more. He says, I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, they are a fragrant offering, acceptable and pleasing to God. And so Paul is writing this book of Philippians to the Philippian church, and basically it's a thank you letter. It's a thank you letter to the Philippians for being so generous. Say generous. You can't say generous without a smile. Some of you need to say generous again. Turn to your neighbor, point your finger, and say generous. Some of you need to become generous. We're getting ready to enter one of the coolest seasons in the life of our church, and we're only going to make an impact if we have a heart of generosity. Look at verse 19. And then... And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now, here's what is pretty awesome. The Philippian church is so generous. They're so generous that when Paul travels, he began to tell other churches about how generous they were. Can, can I ask a question? If somebody were to run and tell or to talk about your life, would they say, I just have to tell you about so-and-so because they're so 
generous? And I'm not talking just finances. Are you generous? Do you, do you share what you have? Do you, do you give financially? Do you give of your time? Do you give of your talent? Do you give that which God has given you? Are you generous? Would someone brag about your generosity? Remember, the greatest definition I could give you of greed is this. And I shared this some time back. Greed is thinking that everything that passes through your hands is meant for you. Greed is thinking everything that passes through your hands is for you. And so would someone begin to brag about your generosity? Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to hear what Paul says to the church in Corinth. He says this in chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, I want you to know about the church at Philippi or the Macedonian churches. He's speaking of the Philippian church. He says, I want you to know about their generosity. Even while suffering in severe trials, and extreme poverty. Everybody look at me. None of you can be exempt from what we're talking about tonight. Because the Philippians, they were broke as a joke. Okay? So if that's your out, if that's your excuse, hang it up. We are all there. We've all been there. And the command for us to be generous does not exempt us if we say, well, I, I'm extremely poverty-stricken, I'm poor. He says the church in Philippi, they were suffering trials, they were, extreme, they were in extreme poverty. Listen to this. Their lives have overflowed with joy because of their amazing generosity. He said, I personally witnessed their giving, not simply giving what they could afford. So check this out. The Philippians, they were so generous, they even gave more than they could afford. Say more. Some of y'all are going to need to smile, say more. Yeah. He says this, but giving even beyond their human ability. Now, we just finished a series on the Holy Spirit, and all y'all were all jacked up and excited about the power of the Holy Spirit working in your lives. Listen to me. This is an area that the Holy Spirit wants to work in your life. You can't be all giddy last week about the Holy Spirit, but you don't let him have your resources. Okay? Because check this out. They were giving beyond their human ability. So if it was beyond their human ability, who was empowering them to give? God, through the person of the Holy Spirit. He said no one told them to do it. Nobody had to tell them to be generous. It was due to their own generous hearts. Say generous hearts. In fact, they begged and they pleaded for the privilege of getting to serve God's people. Let me say it again. They begged and they pleaded for the privilege of giving to serve God's people. They had this attitude. We get to do this. Say that with me. We get to do this. Say it again. We get to do this. We are headed into one of the coolest seasons of our church's life, and we get to do this. He goes on to say this. And they gave in a way that we did not even expect. They first gave themselves. Romans 12.1. Remember that? Jake's been telling us what worship is. It's giving of ourselves. He says, first they gave themselves to the Lord. And then after they gave themselves to the Lord, they then gave to us. That is what pleases God. That is what pleases God. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to give you six benefits of generosity. Six benefits of generosity. Okay? And so we're going to look at the Philippian church, and we're going to see... Um, some of the areas in which they were generous. We're going to see um, six benefits, because check this out. If you have your Bible, um, Proverbs 27, 11. Let me read that to you. This is good stuff. Let 
maybe I switch that to 1127. We may end up scratching that. All right. I'll look at it in a minute. Uh, but there's a proverb that says it's a benefit to us. Uh, there are things that are a benefit to us. And so uh, we want to see this tonight. Uh, number one, every time that I'm generous, the first thing that we can expect is this. I earn the gratitude of others. When you are generous, you earn the gratitude of others. If you look at Philippians 4 and you jump back to verse 10, it says, How grateful I am and how I praise the Lord that you are helping me again. Paul is telling the church at Philippi, I am absolutely grateful for your generosity. When you are generous, you earn the gratitude of of others. It goes on to say in verse 14, it was so good that you helped me when I was in need. He says, you Philippians, you are the only ones that gave me financial help. He says, when I brought the good news, it was just you. And then he goes on to say, no other church did this. And then in, in, in that text there in that area, it says that you did this again and again. And again, when I was in need, he says, I am amply supplied. You see, when we are generous in our resources, when we give, people are grateful. We earn the gratitude of others. Did you know um, there is ministry that I have the joy and the privilege of walking in and walking out day in and day out that absolutely would not be possible if you as a church weren't generous? I've been able to do things for people like Mark that would not be possible if it weren't for you and your generosity. And so when you are generous, when we are generous, we earn the gratitude of others. People are thankful. People are able to, to find hope in this life. Philippians chapter 1 verse 3. Philippians 1 verse 3 says this, Every time I think of you, Paul's writing this thank you note to the Philippians. He says, every time I think about you, I become thankful. I give thanks to God for you. Paul was absolutely moved by their generosity. He goes on to say in verse 5, because you've been my partners. Partners in what? In spreading the good news about Christ. And then he says in verse 7, It's right that I should feel as I do about you. It's right that I should be gracious and have a heart of gratitude. For you have a very special place in my heart. He says, We have shared together in the blessings of God. When you are generous, people are grateful for you. Number two, another benefit to our generosity. Number two is this. I show what really matters. Say what really matters. If you're taking notes, write this down. People matter. People matter. When we give and when we are generous and when we, when we honor God through our generosity, it shows that people really matter. But, but we can sometimes confuse those, okay? Oftentimes, uh, you know, from a biblical perspective, we're called to, to love people and to use things. The Bible calls us to love people and to use things. But sometimes we get that backwards and we like to use people and we love our things. Some of you need to write that down. Sometimes we get that backward. We begin to love our things and we use people. You see, when we, when we are generous, it establishes, it declares, this is what matters most. I can tell you, yesterday there were people that thought a 32-inch television mattered most. How do I know that? 
because they had no regard for human life in the process of consuming a 32-inch television. So which is it? What really matters through our generosity? It puts on display what matters most in our life. And if you're being biblically generous, it's always going to reveal that people matter. And why do people matter? Because they matter to him. Who did Jesus die for? Who did God send Jesus for? People. Paul, in the book of Philippians, in verse 10 of chapter 1, he says this, I, I want you to understand what really matters. He's, he's writing to, again, it's a thank you note. And here's your homework assignment this week. Read the book of Philippians, okay? Um, they are the most generous church in all of Scripture. He says, this is what matters. It's your generosity, your love, your compassion for the gospel and for people. In chapter 3, verse 7, he says, all the things... Paul writing, and you, you're familiar with this, all the things I used to think that were so important, he says, I now consider them lost. I consider them worthless in the scope of eternity in the sight of God. He says in Philippians 3, verse 20, he says, we're citizens of heaven. He says, the things that matter most is revealed in our generosity. The third benefit of being generous the third benefit of being generous is this. Throw that one up there. I become more like Jesus. When you give, you are like Jesus. He gave. And to what extent did Jesus give? What limit did he put on his giving? His life. There was no limit. He laid down his life. Say everything. Jesus was so generous, he gave everything. In Philippians 1.11, Philippians 1.11, he says this, Your lives will be filled with the truly good qualities which only Jesus can produce for the glory and the praise of God. In your generosity, you, you become more like God. Jesus. In Philippians 2, I love chapter 2 of Philippians. In fact, um, it's taught me a great deal over the last few years, but, but he says this, don't just look out for your own interest, in verse 4, but look out for the interest of, of who? Of others. So when, when I am generous, I begin to have and, and, and take on the heart and the character of Jesus himself. So, you become more like Jesus. Another benefit, the next benefit of being generous is I strengthen my faith. I strengthen my faith. I loved it when we were reading in 2 Corinthians. He said of the church at Philippi, they gave beyond their own ability. So like, like when they looked at their stuff that they had in front of them, they, they went ahead and they gave, and that put them in a position to where they had to live by faith. Can, can I go out on a limb tonight and say some of you, you have never radically, generously given to the point to where you have to fully rely in faith in Jesus like some of you have never given to the point that you have to rely in faith on Jesus and his provisions of Philippians 4.19. But when you are radically generous, you strengthen your faith because, because there are some of you here tonight, you've done that. How, how many of you have given to an extreme where you knew if it was going to be possible beyond that point, it was going to be, be God? And God showed up and God was faithful. When he calls you to do it the next time, is it a little easier? You bet, because your faith is strengthened. Your faith is grown. And so when you are generous, you grow in your faith. Philippians 4, 6 says this, Don't worry. Don't worry about anything. Somebody define anything. Yes, yeah, some of you, your whole life, 
your whole financial structure, everything you do in life is, is absolutely dictated by your worry of the things. And Paul tells the Philippians, do not worry about anything, but instead, but instead, pray and ask God for everything you need. Always giving thanks. Generosity will strengthen your faith. And for some of you, you're going, you know, I just don't, I don't have faith to do that. Try him. Try him. Malachi 3.10, we'll open that in a few weeks. He, he says, test me in this. Try me in this. And so when you're generous, it builds or strengthens your faith. Um, number five, every time I'm generous, I invest in my eternal home. How many of you are aware this is not, this is not home? This is just a place we're kind of hanging out, okay? Um, uh, there's a fullness to this life. It's, it's eternal. It's, it's without end. And when I'm generous, even here in this life, I'm making an eternal investment. Look at what he says in Philippians 4, 17. Philippians 4, 17. He says, though I appreciate your gifts... Paul says, I appreciate your gifts, but the thing that makes him happiest or the thing that brings him joy is that you have well-earned rewards that you will receive. You have earned and, and you have well-earned rewards that you've received because of your generosity. You have some eternal investment. You, you will receive some eternal reward because of your generosity. Um, in the New American, it says this, I want you to have the profit that is accrued to your account. He goes on to say in, in the, the contemporary English version, it says this. He says, I want you to receive the blessing that comes from giving. And, and remember, be rich. Let me take you back to last year. Be rich. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. He says, give generously to those in need, always being ready to share whatever God's given you. And he says this, by doing this, you will be storing up a real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is only, that is the only safe investment. Remember, what's the saying? Do y'all remember? I will not put my trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. So y'all need to go back and remember where we were a year ago, okay? And in fact, remember we said it with a little attitude? Like, I will not put my trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. You see, when, when I am generous, when you are generous, when we as the body of Christ, when we are generous, we're making an investment in our eternity. And then finally, number six, when I'm generous, I just make God smile. I please Him. When I'm generous, I make God smile. Look at this. He says in Philippians 4.18, your gifts, they're like a fragrant offering. When you give, it's like a fragrant offering, a sacrifice that God accepts and is pleasing to Him. Say pleasing. Pleasing to Him. When you and I, when we are obedient, when we are generous, God delights in our generosity. Now, I told you at the beginning of last year when we, when we started the Be Rich series, I, I don't want to be um, the casual church. I don't want to be the, I mean, there's a lot of things that we've been labeled, but you know what I really desire to be? I want people when they look at us to go, you know, the one thing I know about that church is they are a generous church. Because I can't think of any other word or term that would most put us right up there with like Jesus. They're a generous, they're a loving, generous church. And so as we embark on the Christmas season, as we move forward, we're going to talk about generosity. And, and again, it's not, it's not so that we can pay some bills. It's so that we honor Jesus. It's so that we become more like him. It's, it's because in our individual lives, he calls us to submit, surrender, and obey, and to lay down our lives and to honor him with all that we have. You see, we have this promise. 
We have this promise of Philippians 4.19, but every promise has a premise. You, you cannot, you cannot, when you're living life on your own, when you're hoarding and holding, begin to claim Philippians 4.19. It just does not work like that. But if you are generous and, and you see everything that passes through your hands as a gift from him and you're generous and, and you give that, then at that point you can say, hey God, I'm just trusting you. You said you will meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. But it comes with a condition of generosity. Okay? I can't tell you how many stingy, greedy people I've heard stand and claim that promise. It's not for you. Okay? You got to read it in context. It makes a great bumper sticker. It makes a good uh, little meme on Facebook. But, but it has to be lived out in, in real life as we are generous. Because remember, you cannot outgive God. You just can't do it. Because if you were able to outgive God, you would show him up. And he's not about to let it happen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't outgive God. You just can't. And so the promise, throw that verse up there. The promise is this in Philippians 4.19. Then, it says then. So like if you do this stuff, if you're generous, if you, you have this reflective heart of the, the people in the church at Philippi, if that, then, okay, then is a conditional statement. And the then is conditional on the if. And so if you live a generous life, if you're radically generous, then, then you could come before the creator of the universe, the, the sovereign God who's on the throne tonight, and go, God will meet my needs according to his glorious riches through his son Jesus. If then. So here's two ways you can be generous tonight. Two ways to be generous. These are the only two ways that you can be generous. Are you ready for them? You might want to write them down. Because some of you, you think you're doing great and you think you've got the generosity thing down, but I'm going to maybe clarify something tonight for you. There's two ways to be generous. Number one is you can be generous by reason. You can be generous by reason. Like, for instance, the, the big, um, uh, big storm that blew through the, the, the Philippines, and, and you see on the news or on Facebook, and you see the little Red Cross thing, text this number to give $10, and so you're going, you're thinking, it's like, okay, there's a cause, and I've got 10 bucks, and I got a cell phone so I can text, and so you're giving by reason. Like, there's a, there's a reason to give, and I have it available, so in my mind, I can reason, I can make it make sense, so I give by reason. Okay? So, so many of you, you're generous, but you're only generous by reason. You, you look at a need, you look at something, or maybe you just look at what you have, and you, you can reason in your mind and make it make sense. So, like, I can afford to give it, in other words. When you're generous by reason, it's giving when you can afford it. That one's pretty easy. Most of us, we, we are good at being generous by reason. Okay? I, I mean, many of us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't overlook an immediate need right in our faces if we had the resources immediately to meet it. We just do that. It makes sense. But here's the reality. The second way you can be generous, and this is what God wants to do through this next few weeks, is he wants you to become generous by revelation. Not by reason, but by revelation. I mean, he wants to speak through the power of the Holy Spirit into your life, and he wants to give you divine revelation. He wants to prove to you his word is true. He's going to give you revelation that says you cannot outgive God. Try me. Some of you, you are going to be driving down the road and God's going to make you put on the brakes and he's going to tell you to meet a need. And you're going to look around and go, God, there's absolutely no way. I don't have it with me. I can't see how you're going to meet it. But you just say, but I'm obedient and I'm going to do it. And it's through revelation and just obedience. And then when you do that and you're faithful, God comes alongside because you can't outgive him. And he returns, restores. In fact, some of you, you need more money. Some of you, you need more time. 
Some of you, you need just more in your life. Check this out. I don't know. It's a principle with God. I just can't quite figure out. But every time you give to God, He does this thing, multiple, multiplication. Multiplication. And so some of you need to, to be generous by revelation. In other words, God, what is it you want to give through me? There have been times in Jennifer and I's life in fact, I remember um, there was a time in New Boston, Texas. We were, were driving and traveling through, and so you heard this story and, and saw this individual family that needed some help. And um, I didn't give by reason, because I had a hundred reasons why those people did not need my money. I'm just being honest. Uh, one was they were standing there and um, they were smoking their cigarettes, and I was super righteous and. Um, you know, I began to make a judgment call and going, that's reason number one, they don't need my money. They had money to buy cigarettes. And so I didn't choose that day to give by reason because reasoning didn't make sense. But the Holy Spirit prompted me to give, to give, to give. And he put an amount in my head and put an amount in my head and I kept arguing with him because that's really all the cash we had left. And so Jennifer comes out and I said, Jennifer, God's telling me to give to them. And she said, yeah, I know. You're supposed to give them. And she told me the exact amount. And so God put that within us by revelation to give that. And, and it didn't make sense, okay? Because looking at what we had, that was, that was it. That was the end of it, okay? And so for some of you, you've had those moments. It doesn't make sense. It's not reason, but it's by revelation, when it's, when it's that, when God's asking you to be, generate, be generous through revelation, be obedient. Be obedient. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. In verse number 35. It says, In everything I did, I showed you that by the kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. And so Jesus said, It is more blessed to give, say give, than to receive. As you experience this weekend, as you've thought about, as you have pondered thanksgiving, uh, may we shift our attention from thanks to giving. Throw that last screen up there. Next weekend is our Christmas offering. And, and for some of you, you, you come out and you faithfully give at this time of the year. But let me just say this. This Christmas offering will be the 12 days of Christmas. I mean, this is the resources. This is, this is what we will use to give out Walmart gift cards at Walmart. This is the resources we will use to, to give gift baskets to our city officials at the DPS and EMS and our school teachers. This is what will fund to give um, free coffee and sodas at Rhodes one day. This is what will fund all those things, okay? And so... So be generous. Next weekend, you have an opportunity um, to do that. But again, let's shift our, our thinking, and you can throw up the final slide, Cana. Let's shift from thanks to the giving. Let's, let's take our mind from the thanks, and let's, let's give. Here's, here's the invitation tonight. How, how does God want you to give? By reason or by revelation? If it's by revelation, it's where you say, God, it all belongs to you. And so, God, I just want you to reveal to me what it is I'm to do. Can, can I be vulnerable and honest for just a moment as your pastor? In this season, in the church life, and in the, this, this time in our, our church family, I, I just finished a series about the Holy Spirit. And, and here's the awesome thing. If you and I, all of us together, if we stop, we yield, and we listen to the Holy Spirit, 
for one, we'll be generous. But two, we will do ministry at a level in this community that we've never seen or experienced before. And so if the church isn't doing ministry to some expectation you have, you and I, we hold the key to that. Are we listening to the voice of God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what it is that you're calling us to and who you're calling us to be. Father, I thank you for the reality that this weekend we have been able to give thanks. And Lord, there is so much to be thankful for. But Lord, I pray that in our, in our lives, Lord, that we would return thanks, Lord, through giving. Lord, that we would be generous with our time, that we'd be generous with our talents, that we'd certainly be generous with our finances. Lord, as we go into next weekend when we take our church's Christmas offering, God, I pray that each of us, God, wouldn't look at our pocketbook and decide what we can do, what we can afford, what we can reason to do. But God, I pray that we would just ask you, God, would you be, be faithful to reveal by revelation what it is we are supposed to, to give and to surrender to make a gospel impact in this community. God, I am so thankful that you are showing us so much, that God, you are teaching us to rely on and to walk in your Holy Spirit. And so God, we just come before you tonight, and we ask that Lord, you would begin to even lay on our hearts now. Church family, in just a few moments, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. But before you do, let me just say this. For some of you, the Holy Spirit is doing what he said he would do, and that is to convict. Let me say this. The Holy Spirit never beats you up. Shame and guilt is not from God. That's the enemy. And so please, 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 never, ever, ever, please never, ever, ever give out of guilt or shame. Okay? But for some of you, there's, there's been genuine conviction tonight. And for some of you, God's not going to let you leave this place before you give or before you respond. And so you can do that during this time of invitation. For some of you, you, you still haven't come and sat in the Thanksgiving chair. And maybe you need to do that before we leave tonight. And so just let's stand to our feet and let's lift our voices as we sing. And, and would you respond to God tonight? Would you respond with a heart of generosity as we close tonight?